audio check.
All right, good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock by my watch. And so we are going to be commencing very, very shortly. Just wait a few seconds here to see if we have anybody coming online. And then we'll begin the presentation. All right, so we are going to get started. Uh, we might have some people joining in later on, but they can always watch the playback and just be a little bit behind us. And so before we get started this evening, uh, just a few little housekeeping items. Uh, so first of all, the comments for this presentation are disabled. And so I will be not, ta uh, not taking any live comments um, during the duration of the presentation. If you do have questions, uh, that you think of while the presentation is underway. Uh, you'll notice a number of uh, items up on the screen right now. And you'll see um, addresses for social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you'll also see an email address. You can email me during the course of the presentation and if I get it before the presentation's over, I will try to answer the question at the end. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we will get started with the uh, with tonight's presentation so um, tonight is the last online presentation that I will be doing um, these started back at the beginning of April and this is the fourth one that I have done and it's been a very interesting ride some technical issues working out some sound issues hopefully everybody can hear me uh, tonight hopefully I've got rid of that nasty little echo uh, that's been an issue in the past so the topic of tonight's presentation ladies and gentlemen is the pulse in mine and we are going to be taking a look at the history of that particular endeavor from 1885 to 1921. And so we're going to be taking a look at the struggle to try to uh, extract iron um, from what is known as the Gunflint Iron Range. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the intrigues and some of the issues that went on and, and how it all kind of played out. And uh, unfortunately, how every attempt ended in failure. So uh, before we get started with tonight's presentation, uh, some of you might be tuning in for the first time and uh, not familiar with the presentation or the presenter. And so just to introduce myself, my name is Dave Battistel and I am a history teacher in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And uh, I've been at this for quite a number of years, which I'll talk about in a second. And so on your screen here, you can see uh, a number of photographs. And, and so I have been teaching uh, at St. Patrick High School for the past 22 years and I also coach football. Um, I also am married, have a couple of great boys. Um, the center photograph is actually um, uh, one of my sons, my older son Ethan, um, this past year's football championship. So I'm very active in the community and as I mentioned I have been doing a lot of research on topics that are related to and about the Pulse in Mind for a very very long period of time. Uh, I first became interested in um, some of the topics related um, to tonight's um, presentation uh, back in 1990. Uh, I made my first visit to North Lake uh, back during that time. And four years later, I started formally researching uh, the history of the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway and also began researching a lot of the associated ventures with that railway. And that includes things like silver mining, logging, and in this particular case, um, iron mining. And as you're going to see, unfortunately, or fortunately, you cannot separate um, these topics. They, they are sort of very in, intertwined. They're very symbiotic. They kind of feed off of each other. Now, uh, you'll notice the photographs at the bottom. Uh, again, they are spread over a long period of time. Um, actually, all of the pictures that you see here were all taken in the Boundary Waters area. It's one of my favorite places to visit. My first visit to the Minnesota um, side of Gunflint Lake um, the railway and some of the mines that we're going to talk about was in 1998 and I've made many trips since then to that area so I'm very very familiar with it. Um, my research has also taken me to many places um, outside of Thunder Bay, um, libraries, archives, etc. Um, I've 
I'm planning someday to to write a book uh, about the railway and about the pulse and mine. Um, however, I'm currently working on another related project that I'm hoping to finish up. Um, this whole COVID situation has kind of pushed everything back a little bit, um, but uh, eventually a book will come out. Now, I do have a little sidebar that I'm going to be kind of working on in the meantime, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the presentation. So, um, again, if you're new to these presentations and it's the first time for you tuning in, um, what I have done is in the last year or so, um, I've done a lot of these presentations for the past over 20 years, uh, talking about the railway, talking about things like the Pulse and Mine, etc. And so in the past few years, I've started putting this slide into my presentations. And uh, again, if you're new, you haven't heard this sort of explanation. On the surface, uh, we, we, we always have this um, tendency to sort of categorize history that this history belongs with this place and this history belongs with this other place. So in this particular case, um, you know, you have somebody like myself, uh, who's Canadian, uh, who lives in Thunder Bay in the province of Ontario, and, and I'm basically talking about a subject that is related to the history of Minnesota. And so on paper, these two places seem very, very different. Uh, obviously, different sides of the border, different ideas, different way of developing. But the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, and again, this is why I include this slide, is that we're talking about topics that cannot be separated. Um, they are symbiotic. They, they, they feed off of each other. And so if you've seen some of my past presentations, uh, I've again talked about this idea, the fact that you can't separate these two things. If we're talking about the pulse in mind, uh, which is something to do with Minnesota, there's going to be a, a uh, uh, an Ontario content to that. Uh, and you're going to see that throughout the presentations, just like in some of my other presentations, where I've talked more about sort of, um, you know, history north of the border. Um, you you can't pull the Minnesota part out of it, right? And so again, there there is this connection. So there's a lot of shared history between uh, between the two countries, and um, I mean you 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 really can't separate these two into you know this or that type of history. It's all one history, and we share this type of history. And uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it. All right. So what I've done with the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, is this is actually a brand new presentation. I've never really presented uh, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight. I've done parts of this in the past. I've talked about the Pulse in Mind. I've talked about one of the people involved with the Pulse in Mind before, but I've never really talked about the entire history of the Pulse in Mind right from the very beginning to um, the last sort of concerted attempt to open it up in 1921, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot lot going on there and this is so this is new to me uh, not necessarily the content of it but presenting it so please bear with me I'm going to do my uh, do my best um, uh, like I said I am very sort of knowledgeable about this subject but um, maybe not as um, um, rehearsed with it as I have with uh, with previous topics all right, so part one of our presentation is basically going to look at the early period, the period that a lot of people are kind of familiar with, that first attempt to open up the uh, the Gunflint Iron Range and the creation of the so-called Pulse and Mine. And that's basically stretched from 1850 to 1893. And there's a lot of things that we're going to be talking about here. A lot of things going in a lot of different places, some very uh, interesting people that we're going to take a look at. So here we go. So where does this story start from? Well, we kind of need a starting place. And so what we're going to do is 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 we're going to start in the Twin Cities. And so we're going to sort of rewind back to the year 1885. And that year, uh, we saw the incorporation of a bank in the city of Minneapolis called the State Bank of Minneapolis. Now, uh, obviously, on a, on a given day, this would be sort of an innocuous um, occurrence. But... Uh, in our particular context and talking about the event that we're taking a look at, this is obviously very, very important. And so, um, uh, again, you know, um, a lot of advertising with regard to it, a lot of newspaper reports coming out. Now, we want to get to this, um, this particular uh, slide here where it basically talks about the people that were involved with this state bank. And so this newspaper article talks a little bit about the meeting that was held. And I will point out a couple of very important people 
uh, that are involved with this particular venture. The first one you'll notice is the president of the State Bank of Minneapolis is John Paulson, uh, one of the people that is um, obviously the center of our presentation. Um, the cashier uh, of the bank, Christian Courtgard. His name is going to come up a lot. Uh, there's some very other notable people as well. Probably the most prominent is A.E. Rice, uh, who was the lieutenant governor of um, Minnesota uh, at one point. Um, personal friend of Paulson. They actually grew up uh, or they spent time in Wilmar, uh, Minnesota together. And so there's kind of a history in there. They were in business together. Uh, and so uh, we're not talking about kind of fly-by-night type of people. We're talking about people that were very prominent in the business community in Minneapolis at the time, very well connected, right? And, and so we're not just talking about a, a, you know, a group of guys that were kind of you know, um, rather shady characters. These, these were fairly well-to-do, fairly um, reputable people in the, in the community. And so a couple images for you. Um, for many, many years, um, I, as I mentioned, I have done a, a separate presentation uh, on John Paulson. And so for many, many years, John Paulson was kind of regarded as this mystery person that nobody kind of knew who he was and nobody really knew the background story of, of him. And as I said, I've done a separate presentation on this and kind of a little sidebar story to this. At the time when I was kind of digging into Paulson's past, uh, and it's a very challenging thing, um, you know, certainly in a state like Minnesota with a, a lot of Scandinavians, there are a lot of John Paulsons out there. And so trying to find the information on the correct John Paulson was not a particularly easy thing to do. And so um, anyway, the, uh, the story of Paulson, so basically he was born in Norway, uh, immigrated with his parents. He ended up in, uh, in Wisconsin and then they ended up in Iowa and then he ended up in um, kind of the Minneapolis area. Uh, and then the Civil War comes along and you can see this is a photograph that was taken of him when he was a private in the 9th uh, Minnesota Infantry. Um, eventually um, he is discharged and then basically um, he discharges, get, takes a discharge so he can be commissioned and basically is com uh, commissioned as an officer in the Colored Infantry. And so he becomes a captain and again, like I said, the PCD other story was very, very interesting. And at the time I was kind of doing all this research, I was sort of aided by, by two very important things. I, you know, believe it or not, I actually put something out on ancestry and, and I got the, uh, sort of, I got the ping back from that and, uh, ended up with, uh, you know, conversing with a, with a gentleman from North Dakota and he gave me some information and then the whole process of that as well. Uh, later on, uh, I, um, uh, I ended up, um, collaborating um, with a professor at uh, Minnesota State University by the name of Lori Lam. She was actually, and it was just sort of one of those coincidental things, she was actually researching John Paulson, um, you know, the, the man from, you know, that had immigrated from Norway, that had ended up in Iowa, and this whole sort of Civil War story. She had no idea of the sort of northern Minnesota iron mining angle of it and so it was very interesting sort of coming together and sort of pooling our resources and actually back in 2016 we uh, we did a presentation at the Northern Great Plains uh, History Conference uh, on John Paulson where Lori did the uh, sort of early history of Paulson and I kind of talked about uh, the later aspects of his life. So again very kind of interesting uh, interesting character and so um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that Paulson, uh, after his time in the Civil War, he ends up in Wilmar and then uh, eventually makes his way to Minneapolis. And that's where he um, eventually uh, meets up with Court Guard. And they obviously become friends and business partners. And so that leads to uh, a number of ventures that they, uh, that they work through together. And so we're going to be taking a look at, we've talked about the State Bank of, of Minneapolis, uh, and then now we're going to take a look at the next little venture here, which is known as the American Realty Company. And so this uh, company was created or incorporated in late 1886, right at the end of the year. And so you can see the, uh, the incorporation article here. And so basically, again, as its name indicates, it was a real estate company. And basically it was a, uh, a company designed to, to purchase um, land, uh, you know, for these individuals because they have aspirations of doing something. And, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how that kind of all sort of plays out. 
So uh, the next thing that we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about how this all kind of ties in with Gunflint Lake. And so the first mention of iron at Gunflint Lake um, comes from this individual here, a guy by the name of Joseph Norwood, uh, does some geographic, uh, sort of geological explorations in the Gunflint Lake area. And uh, basically he's the first one to mention the fact that there is iron to be found at Gunflint Lake. And uh, it's later on, uh, about you know, 35 years later, that this individual here, and for those of you who um, live in the Grand Marais area, will be very, very familiar with, uh, with Henry Mayhew, kind of a, a legend of the, uh, of the area. And so uh, essentially Henry Mayhew was one of the early pioneers uh, of that area of the North Shore. And, uh, you know, again, sort of a very kind of uh, uh, legendary figure in the area. And so he was the one that started actually doing explorations around Gunflint Lake. And he was the one that kind of definitively said, you know, yeah, this is where, you know, there's definitively iron here. This is where I've, you know, I've located it. And this is kind of what gets the ball rolling. Um, and now this little slide here kind of tries to explain a little bit about what's going on. Um, you know, just as a, as a little uh, note here, I am not a geologist. Uh, I am a history teacher and a, uh, and a historian. So uh, I'm not entirely uh, up to speed on all the, uh, ge uh, the geological intricacies of what's going on. But basically what has happened and what um, geologists have determined that basically the Gunflint Iron Range, okay, the, that iron formation that's found uh, in the western end of Cook County that extends, as you can see here on the map, that extends well across the border into Ontario, uh, as far north actually, um, you know, I've seen maps extending it as far north as uh, up there the Sibley Peninsula uh, up here. So it's a very extensive range. And so what geologists essentially believe happened is that the Gunflint Range and the Mesabi Range at one time were actually connected to each other. And then, um, you know, it, at some point in geological history, this uh, there was an intrusion uh, of a formation called the Duluth Complex, which basically separated uh, the two formations, right? So, um, you know, particularly a lot of the people who are tuning in from Minnesota uh, are obviously very familiar with the Mesabi Range and, and the iron mining that still goes on in that particular area. Right, this is just all sort of part and parcel uh, to that. And again, nothing has really been extensively done with the Gunflint Range, but um, you know the 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 mineral is there in the ground. So. Um, this is a little report that um, uh, you know appeared in in a, in a history of, of Minnesota many years later, and it basically talks a little bit about the Gunflint Iron Range, and it says that uh, in 1878, uh, a guy by the name of Winchell, uh, and the Winchell brothers were actually uh, ones that were kind of responsible for kind of uh, writing a lot of the geological and, and um, pioneering a lot of the geological history of Minnesota, and so it says that Winchell visited the area in 1878. Uh, and then it says in 1886, an effort was made directed out of Grand Marais in Cook County to develop the ore. Uh, and it talks about um, the deposits here discovered by Henry Mayhew. And the exploration was conducted by Paulson, Barker, Boyden, and Miller. And those names are going to come up again. And then it talks a little bit about an iron company that was created and a railroad was built. And so this is all the story that we are going to be probing. And again, there's a lot of intricacies that are kind of going on with all of the people that are involved here and the companies that we're, that we're t talking about here. Now, one of the things that was mentioned in that previous slide was a rail connection. And so this is where basically the, the two stories cannot be separated, the two histories cannot be separated. Um, without um, the pulse in mind, you do not have a railway. And without a railway, you don't have a pulse in mind, right? So these two things are very, very much interconnected. So we do want to very briefly talk a little bit about the Port Arthur, Duluth and Western Railway. Now, again, I've talked about this railway line in previous presentations, and you can uh, see those um, uh, presentations on my YouTube channel. I'll have some links for you at the end of the presentation. So the Port Arthur, Duluth and Western Railway was a, a venture that had a very long history. Um, again, it's talked about in some of my other presentations, but um, the, the first sort of real um, formation of this company happened in 1883. It was known as the Thunder Bay Colonization Railway Company, and basically its um, charter was to build uh, from the city of Port Arthur, which is now the city of Thunder Bay, in a south 
southwesterly direction somewhere. Uh, at the time, this um, railways at the time, because of an arrangement with the government, railways were not allowed to build south of the Canadian Pacific Railway into the United States. And so they were kind of a little bit in limbo here. Uh, and it's probably one of the reasons why this railway kind of never really got off the ground. And so four years later, in the year 1887, they, they decide to change the name of the railway to the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway. So that happens in 1887. And there's also a change um, with the root of the railway as well. And that coincides with basically a change in the position of the Canadian government, uh, thereby sort of allowing the um, um, you know railways to cross into the United States, south of the Canadian Pacific Line. So this is the first time we actually see a mention uh, of the line uh, proceeding kind of in a southwesterly direction towards Gunflint Lake. This is the first time we hear Gunflint Lake kind of being tossed around here. Uh, and so this is actually a map in 1887 when that name change happened. Uh, and basically, um, you can see the route of the railway here leaving the city of Port Arthur, um, sort of passing along the valley of the Kaministiqua River, and then along the Whitefish River Valley uh, to Whitefish Lake, and then westwardly towards Sand Lake, which is now Sandstone Lake. And then it's not on the map here, but obviously proceeding uh, a little bit further down to Gunflint Lake. Uh, and so uh, even though the name change happens in 1887, nothing really happens until two years later. And so finally, the company has the financing to construct the, the railway. Uh, and so that construction begins in September of 1889. You can see this article here uh, from August of 1899, basically uh, talking uh, about the railway, extolling the fact that it's going to be constructed and uh, all the money's in place and all these great things are going to be happening. So people are excited. Um, and obviously one of the, the um, big goals of the railway is going to be to get down to Gunflint Lake and to haul this iron that uh, out of this mine that is being developed in that area. That wasn't really kind of a big thing that was pushed uh, at this time. Um, southwest of Thunder Bay, closer to the city, uh, there were silver mines as well. And that was kind of the big kind of um, uh, fought in a lot of people's minds at the time. Um, but again, for a lot of the promoters of the railway, the iron was kind of really the big draw. All right, so uh, construction goes on for the next three years. And so by 1892, the railway is uh, basically in the boundary waters. Uh, construction is happening along North and Gunflint Lake. And so eventually the railway is going to cross into Minnesota. And obviously uh, construction is going to happen there to reach the, the uh, mine that's being developed, which will eventually become the Paulson Mine. Now, crossing in across the border, um, the... Uh, charter that the railway has is not going to cover it. So what they need to do is they need to get a new charter. And so that happens in May of 1892. And so basically um, um, they they get a, uh, a, a charter um, from the uh, from the government of Minnesota to build this railway, li railway line. It's going to be known as the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway uh, of Minnesota. The promoters or the incorporators of this line was um, James Conmey, who was actually the contractor of the line. And if you've heard some of my previous presentations, uh, kind of an interesting story with Conmey because uh, not only was he the main contractor of the railway, but he was also the member of parliament for the Thunder Bay area. And so not only was he reaping the economic benefits of constructing the railway line, but obviously there was probably a political benefit as well. And so, um, you know, certainly in, in today's age where we're a lot more sort of politically aware and we're concerned about kind of, um, uh, you know, these uh, conflicts of interest, um, you know, certainly not so much as the time. Uh, the other people that were involved with the incorporation were Paulson, um, and then it also mentions, I believe Courtguard was in there, and then it also mentions three uh, other individuals that are kind of newly popping up, and these are the three individuals. So we basically have, and they're all from the Minneapolis area, so we have Lewis Reed, uh, who's a lawyer, um, Freeman Lane, who's another lawyer, and Matt Walsh, who is a businessman. Now, what's kind of interesting, not to, you know, sort of pull politics in here, but um, what's interesting about this sort of dynamic is um, both um, Reed and Lane were both Republicans, and it does mention that in the article. It's very kind of clear about that, And while well, Walsh is a Democrat. And so I just sort of found that very interesting that, um, you know, um, you know, 
at the time uh, seemed to be a lot less uh, partisanship uh, that was going on. And certainly these individuals were able to kind of uh, work together in this in this particular venture. So, um, uh, you know, goes on later on, it talks as, as the railway is getting closer to the border, uh, basically talks a little bit about, um, you know, the, um, the whole purpose of this and basically how it's going to be a big sort of boon for the area. And, um, you know, there's a lot of interviews with John Paulson and he talks about kind of, um, you know, all the iron that they're going to pull out of the ground. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of how that sort of plays out. All right. So now that we kind of have uh, a little bit of history of how the, the, uh, the financing for this mine kind of evolved, now we talked a little bit about the railway that was going to be built into this particular area. We want to actually talk about the um, explorations and the mining that was done in preparation for all of this. So we do want to talk a little bit about the quote unquote pulse in mind. Now I do want to take a second and I do want to emphasize this fact. Uh, I was actually just um, taking a look at something today. Um, there is quite a number of misspellings uh, of Paulson out there. Um, actually I was looking at the um, uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, brochure for the uh, Centennial Trail, which will allow you to visit some of the things that we will talk about here. And actually, Paulson is misspelled on there. It's spelled S-E-N, not S-O-N. Um, I mean, not a particularly big deal for me, but I'm sure there are some people out there in the... Um, you know, in the, in the idea of uh, being exact and certainly, uh, you know, people of Scandinavian background, uh, I'm sure there's some uh, um, big differentiations between S-O-N and S-E-N. So um, if anybody's listening out there, we need to make sure we, uh, we clean up the spelling. Okay, so um, obviously if iron is going to be extracted from the ground uh, in this area, there's obviously have to be a company that is going to look after this. And so in March of 1892, um, the Gunflint Lake Iron Company is incorporated. The incorporators are Courtguard, Paulson, and another new individual that kind of um, makes his presence known, a guy by the name of Orrin Kinney, and he's from Ely. Um, and basically, it you know, and there's another article, I don't know why they... I don't know if this was a typo. They stuck somebody else's name in there. Uh, I've never heard this This Marcus Johnson ever used anywhere close to um, anything to do with the Paulson mine, so I'm not sure why his name uh, ended up in there. But basically, uh, it talks about how this company owns property in Township 65, uh, Range 4 in Cook County, uh, and basically it's very close to the present terminus of the Port Arthur Railway, uh, and everybody's been excited, and uh, talks about Paulson being an, expire, an experienced Minneapolis mining man, and everybody's all excited. Uh, and so we've seen Paulson and Court Guard. So here's a picture of Kinney. Uh, what's interesting about Kinney is his trajectory was very different from that of Paulson and Court Guard. His kind of kept going up after uh, this whole um, um, you know effort uh, at the Paulson mine. He eventually ends up down in the uh, uh, in the Iron Range, and um, the town of Kinney. Uh, which is just, it's a small little town, which is located near Virginia, is actually named after him. Uh, so, uh, interesting little piece of Minnesota uh, trivia there for you. Uh, and so, basically, these individuals uh, come together and basically form this company. Now, um, this document, this, this little snapshot here that you see on the screen, is actually a brand new piece of information. This just came to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I want to thank uh, two people, Tom and JD, uh, for providing this information to me. Uh, basically, this it comes from a notebook. They are available online. Uh, these are from the notes of a guy by the name of U.S. Grant. Um, kind of shocking American name, uh, and yes, his name was Ulysses Ulysses S. Grant, um, obviously named after the uh, the famous um, Civil War general and president. And basically, what he did was he did a lot of uh, geological explorations uh, in the area along the Canadian border. And basically, his notes are now digitized. And so this is a snippet from it. And so what it says in this particular. Um, uh, entry, which comes from September 28th, 19, 1892, it says the Gunflint Lake Iron Company is, um, ha, sorry, the Gunflint Lake Iron Company uh, has leased the lands for 20 years. Uh, and it says the owners are the American Realty Company, which we've already talked about, which was basically um, that company that was set up by Polson and Cartguard to 
purchased lands so that they could mine them. Uh, it also mentions John Miller, whose name came up earlier. Uh, it mentions a guy by the name of H.C. Ackley uh, from Minneapolis. Um, uh, it mentions a S.P. Barker, whose name came up earlier. He's from Chicago. And a Charles uh, Boyderman. Uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it also mentions another guy by the name of Nick Probeck. Uh, now, he's an, another character, kind of a, uh, he's a whole separate story of him, kind of lived most of his life on Gunflint Lake, kind of very interesting character. Then it talks a little bit about here that um, the Gunflint Lake Iron Company, where Court Guard is the president, um, sorry, Paulson's the president, Court Guard's the secretary and treasurer, and Kinney is the vice president. And then it says there are several other stockholders, which we don't know who they are because they're not mentioned. So I think that was that was a little interesting tidbit. And so um, sort of rewind a little bit. Here's an article that kind of talks a little bit about uh, Paulson and it talks a, a little bit about, um, you know, his ideas for the, um, you know, um, you know, for the exploitation of the iron in the area. And so it talks a little bit about, um, you know, John Paulson. He's a veteran iron explorer uh, who went through the booms in the Gojibic and, and Menominee ranges. Uh, and, and that's something that I never really touched on. As I said um, previously, I did do a whole presentation on John Paulson. And I do talk about kind of that history where he was involved in some of those other uh, iron ventures. And so this was, again, not sort of some fly-by-night type of guy. This was not somebody that was just kind of his first kind of kick at the cat here. This was somebody who had been involved in the iron business before. And I firmly believe that these guys thought that this was going to be something that was going to make them piles of money. Um, and, and you know, in this article, he talks a little bit about some of the things that are done, the drilling that's happening. Uh, I like this one here. It says, Mr. Paulson is a plain matter-of-fact man. Um, and it says, uh, I like this part, during the excitement in the South, uh, which is a very eloquent way of talking about the Civil War, uh, it says he was in Georgia and Alabama, was instrumental in opening up several of the ore fields there. Uh, and, and we've never really been able to find any information about kind of what happened there. Uh, essentially, we know that he was involved in the Civil War. We know that he was a captain in the Colored Infantry, uh, that he did after the war spend uh, about a year or two in Texas before um, making his way back to Minnesota. Um, kind of, um, you know, interesting uh, backstory to him. Um, now, uh, eventually what happens is the Gunflint Lake Iron Company signs an agreement with the railway and they agree that over a 10 year period that they are going to ship 1 million tons of ore, 100,000 tons per year over the railway. And again, this is the main reason why the railway was built uh, to Gunflint Lake was to specifically access that mine. And again, there's that symbiotic relationship. The, the mine needs the railway to export the iron. The railway needs the mine to make revenue because the, the eventual goal of the railway is not just to terminate the Paulson mine. They eventually want to build through to Ely um, and so that they have a connection to Duluth, right? Uh, and the terminus of the Duluth and Iron Range Railway uh, Railroad is at Ely. And so that was the idea was to basically have that connection. Uh, and so then it goes on as, as, as sort of work is going on. Here's an article talking a little bit about uh, the Cambria, which is one of the steamers that was that makes trips between uh, Duluth and uh, Port Arthur and Fort William, uh, bringing a steam hoist to the Gunflint Lake Iron Company for their operations at Gunflint Lake. Uh, then fast forward to November. Uh, here's one of those misspelling of Paulson's, um, basically talking about how he's rushing things along at the Gunflint Mine, building new camps, sinking shafts, digging ditches, uh, etc., uh, and then this one here, uh, you know, uh, into December of 1892. So the railway now is pretty much complete. Um, so it's basically says that um, uh, he's conversing with the reporter and he says that affairs of the mine are progressing finally. Uh, 30 men being now employed, opening the deposit. And he expects by springtime to have 150 men at work. So th there's a lot of big things that are happening in this particular area. Now, um, uh, I did mention that I'm a history teacher. My other teachable subject is geography, so I'm, I'm, I have an affinity for maps. And so um, here's a little map for you. So if you're sort of familiar with the area, so this is basically the western end of Gunflint Lake over here. And basically you can see the Gunflint Trail. And so essentially we're talking about this area here uh, was very, very heavily explored and is full of iron. 
Um, you know, um, some people in the area might be familiar with things like magnetic, magnetic rock, okay, which is a very popular sort of uh, hiking spot. Okay, there, there's a lot of iron in the area. So uh, when we're talking about the workings here of the Gunflint Company, we're going to be spending a lot of time right here. So just to the west of the Gunflint Trail, this white line that you see here is basically the Kekakabic Trail. And so uh, essentially a lot of the things that are happening right in that area, and again, one of the reasons why that trail exists is because it was the original wagon road uh, or trail to get into that area. And so uh, basically uh, this is a map, uh, and this map was published in 1899. Uh, in the geo geology of Minnesota. And again, this was all information that was derived from Grant's explorations. And so basically, again, if we kind of backtrack here, uh, this is the area that we're looking in. If I can get my, my mouse here going. Uh, so basically right here, right? So you can basically see this small little lake here and this kind of triangular shaped lake. And then you see this lake here. This is this area that is encompassed in this map here, right? So you can see that small little lake this triangular shaped lake, and then the bigger lake here. This lake today is known as Mine Lake. At the time, it was named Ackley Lake after one of the people that owned the uh, lands in the area. And so what we can see here on the map is a number of things. So this solid line right here, this is the railway line. So this is the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway. So it comes up, uh, basically works its way along the side of this lake here, uh, goes up to um, essentially where the modern Keck Trail is, makes a switch back, and then heads sort of back in an easterly direction back towards where the Paulson Shaft is. So this would be the Paulson Shaft right here. There's a number of workings in the area. Uh, there's another shaft right here and you know again if you're familiar with the area you know what I'm talking about uh, basically you'll be familiar with the uh, the shaft over here at Ackley Lake or Mine Lake and then there's some um, some adits some test pits over here there's a number of test pits in this area uh, the Paulson camp uh, the mine camp was located right in this area here uh, there's another shaft uh, right over here all right, so there's there's a lot of workings in the area. Now, again, come back to that, um, you know, those digitized documents from Grant. So that map that you just saw was actually made from these um, uh, from these sketches that Grant did, right? So this is right out of his his notebook, right? And so again, you can see sort of the rough drawing that he would have made, and then this is sort of the there you can see it says corrected map, and the date here July twenty fifth, eighteen ninety three. And so essentially you can um, basically see again the railway line, you can see the pulse and you can see it's kind of might be hard to see on here on this shaft, okay, shaft, um, then you can see the cap here. So lots of, uh, lots of things going on here. Uh, and then this is the um, um, workings to the further to the west along um, right here, kind of interesting sort of progression of, of things, right? So in here he calls it Chubb Lake, but later on he, he calls it Ackley Lake, and now it's called Mine Lake, and I believe Chubb Lake is a name for another different lake, right? So kind of a little bit of confusing um, sort of series of, uh, of names here, okay? But, but anyway, we know exactly what he's, uh, what he's taking a look at. Now, uh, again, you can visit some of these areas, um, and so um, you may or may not know that there was a hiking trail that was opened up in this area back in 2009. Uh, after the uh, Ham Lake fire in 2007. And so you do pass by some of these things. This test pit was actually been uh, accessible for many, many years. It was located right beside the uh, the Kekakabic Trail. Um, there was a big sign that said Pulse in Line 1893 on there. So basically this is one of the test pits. And um, this one is, is obviously you can see full of water. Uh, on the outside you can see uh, essentially some of the, uh, the diggings. You can see all the kind of the metallic rocks all oxidizing. Uh, from the uh, from the mineral content. It's kind of neat is when you go to these things and you pick up these rocks, you can really tell the mineral content in them because they're super, super heavy, uh, you know, compared to uh, to other types of rocks that you would the, that you would find. Uh, and this is another one of those test pits in the air. And again, uh, you hike that Centennial Trail and you're, you're able to sort of access all of these things today. Um, this is the uh, the shaft on Mine Lake or Ackley Lake. Uh, this photograph was taken in 2010. Now, unfortunately, the last time I was at the Ackley Lake Shaft, which was in 2014, um, because of the fire um, that happened in 2007, and then there was a blowdown in 1999, um, a lot of the canopy 
is now gone from the area. And so when I was there in 2014, you can't even see this shaft anymore. Uh, all of this vegetation that you can see around here was growing up so high that it basically completely uh, blocked off the uh, blocked off the shaft, and so it's basically going to take quite a number of years before um, you know the the forest growth comes back up. That um, you know eventually you'll be able to see back into this uh, into the shaft again. Uh, and so this is the original so-called Paulson shaft. Uh, this one is not accessible, uh, and so it's not it's basically not. Um, uh, off any of the hiking trails or at least close to them. I don't really recommend going there because it's not easy to get to and uh, obviously any of these mine sites are kind of very dangerous uh, because of erosion and uh, instability. And so basically it might be hard for you to see in there but you, you can see uh, essentially the uh, the wooden line shaft is still there. Apparently the shaft is about 105 feet deep um, that you know was was measured in the past, and so this was the uh, the main shaft, and so this was where the railway line basically terminated. And uh, essentially, on the north side of that shaft, basically you can see uh, all of again all of the uh, the um, the rocks that were excavated from the shaft. Uh, again, all kind of that burnt uh, orangey color, all oxidizing uh, from the uh, the mineral content in there. Okay. So uh, basically, um, in um, early 1893, uh, newspapers are talking about here. This is, uh, you know, uh, an article from the uh, St. Paul Globe, basically talking about that the railway's been completed and essentially um, that now uh, it's going to start operating. And obviously, the insinuation is is that uh, eventually they're going to start hauling iron as well. And this is another uh, excerpt. And the reason why I included this one here is it talks a little bit about the. Um, uh, the visit to the mine and so basically it talks about that uh, you know they arrived at the hillside uh, and it says the party under Mr. Paulson's guidance visited several of the iron openings uh, at one place the whole hillside of iron is uncovered and the railway truck runs so close that the first car first iron can be pitched into the cars by the miners right and so um, you know everybody's excited about uh, you know all the things that are going to be uh, going to be coming up uh, so uh, one of the big issues that we have is there are no known photographs of the pulse and mine from the time there are very well might have been pictures taken but whether those pictures now exist um, uh, or not we don't know uh, and so they're very very sort of scant um, you know photographs you have this is one of the few photographs that we have and this photograph was actually taken in 1911 so this is the uh, uh, the trestle um, that crossed um, the uh, the Gunflint Narrows, and so basically in the foreground here is Gunflint Lake, and in the background is Magnetic Lake, and so the Ontario side uh, is on the right side of the screen, and the Minnesota side is on the left side, and so this is the trestle that would have been used to cross from one side um, of the of of the Narrows to the other, and again this would have been the trestle used by the trains uh, to cross into Minnesota. And so here's a little map for you. So this is a 1904 map, basically showing you the route of the railway, and so again, uh, there's the Gunflint Narrow, so the picture we were just taking a look at, and then basically the railway line runs uh, along what is now today the Gunflint Narrows Road, and then basically um, um, most of the Gunflint Trail here in this area is built on top of the railway line, so basically from uh, the Narrows Road uh, all the way to Round Lake Road is all the railway line, and then you can see sort of the railway makes a big kind of loop here, goes into a switchback. The reason why they did that is because they needed to gain elevation. Um, they, they basically had to climb about 200 feet to get to the mine, so they had to sort of make these elaborate switchbacks. And again, you can see a lot of this part of the railway line uh, if you hike the Centennial Trail. And so again, just a little close up, okay, where the, uh, obviously the, the notation of the pulse in mine here, um, located in section 28 uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the township. Um, and so here's, uh, fast forward a little bit, here's an article from March of uh, 27th, 1893, basically talking about how this new iron mine that is being developed in the northern part of Minnesota is going to be a rival uh, to the Masabi Range, right? It, it's 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 going to be the new greatest thing, right? And, and pretty soon there's going to be iron flowing out of this and everybody's going to be rich and, um, you know, the area is going to prosper and it's going to be a great and sort of fantastic um, type of thing. Now, uh, another thing we want to talk a little bit about is um, 
Obviously, in order to mine this area, you're going to need people um, working and living in the area. And so uh, one of the, the ideas that eventually popped up was to create a city at this location. And um, if you've seen some of my previous presentations, you'll have heard of me mentioning Gunflint City um, because there was basically a parallel city that was being uh, at the time developed on the Canadian side of the border and that was known as Lee Blaine and so basically Lee Blaine was going to be set up because it was the Canadian terminus of the railway and obviously Glen Flint City was going to be developed because it was um, the the mining site it was the town at the mining site uh, and so uh, here's an article from the uh, Duluth Tribune in June of 1893 and so basically it says the latest town site project is going to be Glen Flint City um, near the Gunflint Mine, and uh, basically it says few people realize how many settlements are going to, uh, into the north of us, uh, and this obviously again is going to be, um, you know, it's all kind of happening as, as a benefit from all, all of the mining that is going on. Now, the American Realty Company, remember, so remember, one of the, they're one of the big property owners, they actually put out a map, a plat map, uh, of the area and so it extols the virtues of Gunflint City and so I'm not going to read through all of this but it basically talks about Gunflint City it's in Cook County it's on the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway um, and it talks about the Gunflint Range being this promising iron deposit and all these great things that are going to happen and there's a map now I do apologize it's kind of hard to see on this map um, basically this is a photocopy of um, in, you know, I don't even know if it's a photocopy of the original or if it's a photocopy from a photocopy. But anyway, uh, essentially what you see on here is you can see the railway line coming down. You can see Gunflint City right here. And then there's all these blocks of land. And it says all these lands are owned by the American Realty Company. Shows you distances to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to other places. Uh, and so, again, this is, you know, what they're, uh, what they're you know, hoping to, uh, to do. Right, and, and it sort of goes on and on about uh, all the virtues of this particular place. Now, um, there's always sort of the little intriguing things, and so this is kind of one of those intriguing things. And so while the, uh, the um, development of the mine site was happening, and as the railway was nearing completion, um, th this sort of made the, uh, the newspapers in, uh, in, in Thunder Bay. And so it talks a little bit about something called the Hotel de Marguerite, uh, now rears its stately walls near the mine. And uh, kind of really doesn't say much. And then uh, a little while later, it talks about Hotel Marguerite again is about finished and will be occupied this week by its charming owner. Now, uh, the reason for its name, Hotel uh, de Marguerite, is named after this woman here. Uh, and her name is Margaret. Uh, she's better known as Mag Matthews. And um, she's kind of a very interesting uh, character, originally from southern Ontario, made her way up to the, uh, the Thunder Bay area. And uh, I'm not going to go into a, to a lot of specifics. This is kind of a family-friendly presentation. But um, uh, again, Mag Matthews was very, very well known in the, uh, in the Thunder Bay area for her business establishments. And um, so basically being a very enterprising woman, and, and ironically enough, she was actually generally regarded as one of the first feminists uh, in the Thunder Bay area, uh, basically because of her business acumen uh, and, and her, and, you know, the way that she sort of, she carried herself. And so basically, you know, she saw this, um, this iron mine going in and, um, you know, the sense that there was going to be, a, you know, a lot of work going on at this mine and there was, there was a business opportunity there. And so she decided that she was going to build this quote unquote hotel um, you know, near the mine site and, and basically um, provide entertainment uh, for the uh, for the men working at the mine. And uh, I don't have the record in here, but um, um, basically she was uh, she was granted actually the first liquor license in Cook County, Minnesota. Uh, so kind of a little sort of interesting uh, piece of trivia there for you. Now, um, one of the interesting things, uh, and again, this has sort of come to light. So we do know that the uh, the Paulson Camp, uh, where we believe that the uh, the hotel was and, and where all the miners were staying, was right here, kind of on the uh, the northwest shore of this of this lake. Now, what's interesting is new information is always coming to light. And so, uh, again, I want to thank Tom and JD for, for providing this to me because uh, this really kind of changed our understanding. And so, um, again, this is from, from Grant's notes. And again, it's talking a little bit about the Gunflint Iron Company and it talks a little bit thing. It goes right at the bottom here and it says, um, 
The town site at the mine is to be known as Gunflint and will occupy the northwest one quarter of southeast one quarter and the north half of the southeast southwest one quarter of section 28. And then it says the Paulson camp is in a different spot. So essentially for years, uh, for a long time, that we essentially believed that the mining town would be built at the same spot that the Paulson camp was. But essentially this is saying something different. So when we take a look at a map, um, and again, I, I do apologize if I got this wrong. I, I had to uh, um, contact some of my friends at the uh, at the U.S. Forest Service uh, last weekend because we don't use this, uh, at least where I'm from, we don't use this township system in Ontario. And so this is sort of a very foreign entity to me. And so I was trying to understand, you know, um, where the heck that they were talking about. And so I've done my best here. I may have got it wrong, but from my understanding, and again, I do have a little bit of a geography background, but basically this rectangular box that I've put here uh, is what I interpret where this town site was going to be. And you'll notice that it is to the north of where the mining camp was, right? And so, uh, again, they probably had aspirations of, of locating the town a little bit closer to where the, uh, where the mine was as opposed to the, uh, the Paulson camp. So now, in speaking of the camp, um, this is basically the camp site um, as it appeared in 2010. So this is, a set, I'm essentially standing on the railway grade looking across uh, the piece of lake here towards that northwest corner of that unnamed lake. And so this uh, photograph, these next couple photographs were actually taken by myself in 1998 uh, on that first visit. When I went into that area, there was no centennial trail. I actually hiked into this area um, um, along the Keck and I also came in along the old railway grade which was completely grown in and very difficult to uh, uh, to navigate there was no uh, lidar or Google Earth or anything like that um, you know to uh, to help you navigate um, these next series of photos actually uh, are courtesy of the uh, the US First Service that um, you know they sent to me uh, and so uh, this is the remains of one of the structures in 1998 I don't know when these pictures were taken I would assume probably in the 70s and you can see there's a lot more visible uh, at the Paulson camp uh, you can see sort of the remains of some of, some of the uh, the structures that were there sadly after the blowdown of the fire there's essentially nothing left to be found there. Now, the uh, the Forest Service, the archaeologists have done some explorations at the site and these are some of the interesting things that they have pulled up. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, you know, uh, a piece of, uh, you know, fine um, glassware uh, that was there, uh, bottle. Uh, and this is probably the most interesting object. I've never seen this firsthand, but what's been described to me is that this is the sole of a shoe. But it's the size of this shoe that's very interesting. Um, what has basically been said is that this shoe is a very small shoe, probably s much smaller than a shoe that a man would wear. And so there's sort of a lot of belief that this is a woman's shoe, sole of a woman's shoe. And so again, it lends a lot of credence to, um, you know, that hotel uh, that was constructed there, and uh, you know some of the uh, uh, some of the workers that would have uh, that would have worked there. So kind of an interesting little tidbit. Now, um, again, there's all this optimism. There's all of these great things that that people are looking forward to. Unfortunately, it comes to a screeching halt, and it comes very very quickly. And so at the same time that the, the pulse in mine is you know sort of almost being ready to go. Um, the railway is now complete. This is their first time card that they publish in June of 1893. Um, basically, trains are now regularly going from Thunder Bay down to Gunflint. We don't know that they were regularly crossing into Minnesota. Um, the Gunflint that's indicated here is basically the Canadian side of Gunflint. Um, there was a, uh, a turning Y, basically a place where the trains could turn around. And that's the only thing that we, we think that they, the trains were actually doing in Minnesota was just turning around. Um, but, but basically, at least there was regular service. So at least uh, three runs a week that were heading down to, uh, to Gunflint Lake. Now, unfortunately, as this is all happening, uh, the storm clouds are brewing. And so this is a, uh, an article uh, from uh, the New York Times of May 7th. 1893 and it's basically talking about uh, the fact that there is a um, 
there's a panic going on, right? The, the, the world is entering a depression and, and some not so great things are, are happening. Uh, and so eventually what happens is this sort of devolves into something called the Panic of 1893. Um, and it was one of the great sort of world depressions uh, of the time. And I mean, the timing could not have been worse, right? So just as the railway gets built, just as they're trying to open up this mine, uh, everything comes crashing down. And so uh, here's an article uh, that um, from the Chicago Tribune of June of 1893, and it talks about the impact of the um, the financial panic. And one of the big things that was happening was uh, a lot of people at the time did not trust banks, and they were worried that the banks were going to go under. And so what would happen is a lot of people would go to the bank and essentially try to take their money out. And so this article um, essentially is saying that um, the State Bank of Minneapolis suspended payment today owing to heavy withdrawals of deposits uh, since March, uh, the total coming to $100,000. There was a meeting of the heaviest deposits of the bank today, but present court guard, so at the time Christian court guard was the president of the bank, could not be present to meet them. The idea of having to close his bank having completely prostrated him, right? So he's basically so upset that he is like having medical issues. Right. Um, and, um, you know, but everybody's like, no worries, no worries. Right. It says the bank's attorney states the suspension will be only a matter of days when the bank will resume business. Um, you know, prominent director stated that there will be absolutely no loss to the depositors. Uh, the securities of the bank are in excellent condition. Da, 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 da. Well, they're saying all of this, but this is not the case. Right. And essentially, uh, from what we can piece together, what's happened uh, is um, obviously all of these uh, explorations, all of this um, iron business that was going on cost a lot of money. And um, we're sort of assuming that maybe not all the financing was in place. So what we think happened was Court Guard was basically funneling money from the bank into the uh, American Realty Company and the Gunflint Lake Iron Company. Now, again, I really don't believe now that's very shady, right? And and not, um, you know, sort of a very legitimate practice. But I really, really think this was not done to 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 basically, um, you know, you know, defraud the people that were were, were investing in the bank. Uh, I legitimately think that these guys thought that this iron deposit was going to make them rich. And they and I think that they just basically did this uh, under the assumption that once the, the mine got going, once everything was happy, right, they could just secretly kind of put all the money back and everybody wouldn't know any better, right? Nobody would be the wiser, right? But unfortunately, this financial panic uh, intervened. And so literally days later, all right, so we're talking about this um, uh, you know, I was talking about the, the 23rd, 24th of June, right? Two weeks later, or two and a half weeks later, Lewis Reed, so remember, Lewis Reed was one of the guys that was the incorporator of the Minnesota Railway, uh, has been appointed receiver to dispose of the property of the American Realty Company dissolved. So literally two and a half weeks later, the American Realty Company has gone under, right? It has become insolvent, okay? Uh, and uh, so here's an article from the, the 24th of August. Uh, so it talks a little bit about the American Realty Company, one of the corporations which borrowed extensively from the state bank, borrowed, quote unquote. Um, so it says the assets scheduled is mining and railroad stock, right? And so again, a lot of kind of sketchy things going on. Um, like I said, I don't believe that it was done to sort of scam people. I, th I think it's sort of legitimate. It just, they kind of got themselves over their heads and uh, were a victim of, of circumstance. And so by the 30th, um, basically it says the Gunflint Lake Iron Company uh, has been sued for its indebtedness. Um, and, and so that company has gone under as well, right? So everything has just, within a matter of a few months, everything's just sort of come crashing down um, and, and just completely fallen apart. Now, one of the most interesting episodes that happens at the same time this is all going on is a photo opportunity. And so this is uh, uh, from in, uh, a newspaper in the Thunder Bay area. And so right around the time that all of this stuff is falling apart, the, you know, the American Realty Company, the Gunflint Lake Iron Company are all being sued, right, because they've, you know, become insolvent and they owe money, right? Um, the Premier of Ontario, right, so, you know, the, the political leader of the province of Ontario comes to Thunder Bay, 
for a visit, Sir Oliver Mowat. And so they want to show him all these great things that are happening. So what they do is they stick him on a train and the train takes him down to Whitefish Lake, which is about halfway between Thunder Bay and Gunflint. And so at Whitefish Lake, his train is met by a train coming from the West, coming from Gunflint Lake. And I don't know if you can make up the title of the article here. It talks about the car of iron ore. Uh, so it says, a car loaded with iron ore, which had been forwarded from the iron mines of Gunflint Lake and attached to the train. Uh, and there were photograph uh, photographers that were there and they took pictures, and right? So they're turning this into this great big sort of PR event, right? Talking about all these great things that are happening, right? But it's all spin. It's all spin because we know that everything has fallen apart. And so here's this famous photograph uh, that was taken uh, on that visit. And so basically you can see the train here uh, at the station and you can see this flat car that has the iron on it. And basically the iron that was on that car, right? The, when they sort of melt, uh, you know, smelted that down, uh, they got enough iron to make a very, very small horseshoe. That was all the, the iron that they got out of the... Uh, uh, out of the material that was taken out of the mine. Uh, and, and for the most part, it's really the only iron that ever came out of the mine. There is kind of a little side note to that, which I'll talk about later. But for the most part, that's the only, um, you know, uh, sort of celebrated iron that came out of the mine. All right. And then the lawsuits uh, continue. All right. And everything just continues to fall apart. And it finally culminates in November of 1893 when Court Guard is arrested. Uh, and he's charged with embezzlement. Uh, and eventually he is um, convicted and he actually spends uh, time in prison. And um, then eventually his, uh, I think he's pardoned. And um, sort of a very sad story for, for both Court, Court Guard and Pulse and how it all kind of plays out for them. So Court Guard, again, spends time in jail. I think he's pardoned in 18, I think he only spends a couple of years in jail. Um, so by 1895, 1896, he's out and then um, kind of bounces around. We don't really care sure he is, but we know that eventually uh, he ends up working as a janitor in Hoboken, New Jersey, right? We, we can track that down through census records, right? So, you know, he goes from this great sort of prominent Minneapolis businessman, obviously cannot show his face in the city anymore and ends up over on the East Coast. Uh, Paulson's story is even more tragic um, you know, obviously he doesn't, you know, suffer the same consequences as, uh, as court guard, but literally by, um, you know, the, the time that photograph was taken of the iron car, he's already gone. Um, he's already left the Minneapolis area. And, um, we know that because, um, his wife and him had an adopted daughter and she dies in, uh, I believe September of 1893 in Oklahoma. Um, and so, I mean, very tragic turn for him. And then in uh, seven years later, 1900, his wife dies in, uh, in Oklahoma as well. And then he ends up kind of bouncing around all over the place, um, you know, and we can track that because of his Civil War pension records. Uh, he ends up in Nevada and then he ends up in California and he finally ends up in, uh, in, in Oregon. Uh, and he ends up uh, there for a number of years and, you know, his occupation's a farmer. Right. He goes. So he goes from this very prominent businessman, very well connected to kind of just, you know, tending a farm in, in Oregon. And eventually he makes his way back to Minnesota, um, you know, um, in his last few years. And eventually he dies in uh, in Minneapolis in, in 1914. So sort of a very kind of tragic end to uh, to the whole story and, um, you know, very sad sort of twist to all of it. Now, um, with regard to their their iron lands, uh, and so you can see here again, there's Lewis Reed, um, the receiver for the Merrill uh, Realty Company, uh, basically trying to sell off their lands. This is from 1896. And so eventually the lands are sold uh, and that sort of starts the next phase uh, of the uh, of the history of the Gunflint area. Now, I did want to throw this this little slide in here. I, I think it's kind of a very interesting one. Um, I did have a question. Somebody asked me about kind of you know um, you know a little bit about sort of the construction of the mines and the development of the mines and explosives. And so this is an article. This is from the Manitoba Free Press, and you can see the date is January 29, eighteen ninety five. It talks about dynamite ballots, uh, unusual excitement in Port Arthur and Fort William. Uh, and so essentially what the story is, um, and so I'll just read it to you. It says, there is very nearly being what is seemed 
uh, it's it's uh, termed usually a dynamite out, uh, outrage in Port Arthur on Saturday last. It appears that the Gunflint Iron Company, who were mining at the end of the terminus of the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway in Minnesota, left when they failed during the Panic of 1893 some 71 boxes of dynamite stored at the mine. Some enterprising Port Arthurite stole it, then smuggled it across the boundary, uh, brought it to Port Arthur on the railway, and then stored it in a vacant building. And then what ends up happening is the authorities find out, and then basically the customs uh, guys come and confiscate it, and then they move it to a secure spot. But now nobody knows what to do with this stuff because who does it belong to, right? It doesn't belong to the guy who smuggled it, but now they've taken it across the border and the company that originally owned it doesn't exist anymore. So how does this all kind of play out? So I just thought that was kind of a, uh, an interesting little tidbit. Um, you know, 71 boxes of dynamite, right? I mean, that's not just, you know, a few sticks of dynamite, all right? I don't know how many sticks of dynamite are in a box, but um, it seems like it's pretty uh, um, substantial amount of explosives. Okay, so this starts the next phase, okay? And you're going to find these next little sections are a little bit shorter. Uh, and so part two uh, is uh, the years 1896 to 1897, and uh, it talks a little bit about the uh, attempted development of a nickel mine in the area. And so uh, the first sort of um, indication of that, publicly at least, uh, happened in uh, 1896. Uh, so basically this um, uh, article is talking about how uh, a large party of American capitalists left Port Arthur uh, for the vicinity of Gunflint Lake, where it is rumored to have made a very extensive find of nickel. Now, this was not the first talk of nickel. There was actually um, talk about this. Actually, one of the shafts um, in the Gunflint area is actually a nickel mine shaft. Uh, and that's actually talked about in the records, right? So this one here, going back to, to Grant's explorations. So this is from October 6, 1892. Uh, and it goes on and talks about, it says, Mr. Uh, Paulson says that he has had the amount of nickel determined in um, this. And it says it's 87% nickel. So Paulson already knew that there was nickel in there. And he was trying to exploit that as well at the time. Um, essentially, now we just have a new group that's kind of focusing more on the nickel end of things. Uh, and so here's an article uh, from later in 1896, uh, talks about nickel in Minnesota, the largest deposits of nickel in the United States. Um, the Paulson mine is sold and essentially talks about who is doing this. And it, it mentions that it's uh, under the auspices of the Johnson Nickel Mining Company. Um, so it says eight years ago, St. Paul man named Frank Johnson, a Scandinavian, came up with the uh, came up to the range of exploring. Kind of an interesting story with Frank Johnson. I was kind of looking into him a little bit in the presentation. Kind of a little interesting side note too. Um, Johnson grew up in Wilmar. And we also know that somebody else spent time in Wilmar and that was John Paulson. Uh, and Paulson's actually buried in, in Wilmar. So uh, I wonder if there is you know, some, some, some knowledge there that was, that was going on. So anyway, um, basically Frank Johnson was the guy that, that, you know, he was trying to, uh, to open up this, uh, um, you know, this deposit. And again, this was going to be, a, uh, everybody was excited about this. The people of Cook County were excited. The people in Ontario were excited, obviously, because, you know, maybe we can get this railway going again. Um, and, um, you know, there was again, you know, a lot of optimism, uh, on board, um, and so here's another article again, just talking uh, about the uh, you know the plentifulness of the the nickel uh, that's in the area and and how it's going to be uh, you know great for everybody. And you know continuing in 1897, they're talking about freight um, for Gunflint Lake and they're bringing up a drill uh, to to you know work the deposits there. Uh, again, another article talking about uh, the iron and nickel and in the immense amount of, of these minerals that are located in the area. Uh, but really, kind of after that, everything just kind of fizzles again. Um, and, and again, kind of a little interesting side note. So if you remember um, back to that picture with the, uh, the carload of iron, um, that was not the only carload of iron that actually came out of the Gunflint mine. And so uh, I actually have two articles here for you, uh, both, both within a few days of each other. And so you can see the date here is the September the 2nd, 1897. And it's basically from the Fort William Daily uh, Journal. And it's talking about how this contractor has imported several carloads of rock from, the, from Gunflint, Minnesota over the railway. Uh, it says it is much cheaper and more plentiful than the Canadian stone uh, and better for building. And it's going to be used as a foundation for a grain elevator. And then, you know, um, nine days later, again, talking about 13 cars of stone arrived um, for the foundation of this uh, um, elevator. Uh, it says this is the first consignment received of this work. The total amount to be brought here will be 
you can't read the number of cars. So somehow or another, that got cut off. It says the rock is low grade iron ore that was taken from the Paulson mine as the only cost is duty and transportation. So basically they're just taking uh, all of this leftover um, iron uh, ore uh, that's just sort of kicking around and nobody has any use for it. They're just essentially just throwing it in, in cars and, and shipping it down to uh, uh, shipping it up to, uh, to Thunder Bay. Okay, so after that, sort of all kind of fizzles, right? Then and there's a few years that kind of pass and then there's another uh, attempt that's made. And so around about 1900, um, you know, we start hearing reports again. So uh, the Algoma Miner and Weekly Herald is a Thunder Bay newspaper and it says uh, cheering reports coming from the old Paulson mine. Um, so it says Northern Road runs to the mine carrying supplies and mails once a week. Uh, it is said some of the ore from this mine will be shipped this summer. So again, everybody's kind of getting pumped up and excited um, that great things are going to be happening. And then fast forward a little bit. This is kind of a, uh, an interesting article. So this one's from October of 1900, and it actually talks a little bit about a, uh, a labor issue. Uh, and so it says um, basically that uh, on the train arriving from Gunflint, there were 13 men. Uh, who had been uh, working until recently for the North American Mining Company on an iron mine, uh, which is well known here as the old Paulson Mine. And essentially what it says is that um, these men showed up to work, and, and obviously they were not American, they were Canadian, and they were allowed to work. And it says, um, at Gunfield, they were allowed to cross the border by the man in authority stationed there and had started work at once. Uh, some four weeks later, the same United States authority who had allowed them to cross the border appeared at the mine and informed them that they would no longer be permitted to work uh, as they were not citizens of the United States and therefore breaking the law. And so obviously um, the customs agent, who we know is Richard Dalman, uh, I guess made inquiries and basically was told that, yeah, these guys can't work here anymore, so you gotta give them the boot. And so unfortunately these guys uh, were now sort of sent back and again, very indicative of kind of what was happening and what was going on. And so things kind of staggering on and then here's another article, this is January of 1901, it says the American uh, Mining Company uh, operating the old Paulson mine are said to be meeting good results. Um, you know, there's high grade ore. Um, you know, they're talking about how they're, you know, getting ready to ship. And, um, you know, it's a very common thing, right? You know, we're getting ready, we're getting ready, 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 but nothing really happens, right? And uh, fast forward, uh, you know, a few weeks, and uh, this is into February of 1901, it talks about the, uh, the miners of the Paulson mine are on strike. Uh, they want a 25 cent raise. Um, and, uh, and so it says, uh, basically, these guys are going to get fired uh, and they're going to bring in new men. And it says the wages paid at present are 200, uh, 200, $2.25 per day uh, is what they were making to work at the Pulse and Mine. And so fast forward a few months. And again, they're talking about, um, you know, all the work that's going on. Uh, the North American Iron Company has been working away um, for a year and they're putting in seven diamond drills and uh, shown several million tons of hard magnetic ore and they're getting ready to ship and then nothing happens, right? So again, it's just sort of let down after let down after let down. Now, um, what's interesting is we do have a map um, of this particular area and the date of the map is kind of confusing because I've seen this labeled 1905, I've seen it labeled 1915, kind of really bizarre kind of thing. And you can actually see the different sections here. Um, and so you can actually see the different um, uh, property owners, right? Uh, and so the North American Iron Company here, right? The North American Iron Company here. Uh, you can see some of the original owners here. So Miller, uh, Ackley, um, uh, Boyden uh, down here. The very interesting one that I see on here that's kind of, that kind of really aroused my interest is, oops, went the wrong direction here, is right there. This little section here is owned by the Duluth and Iron Range Railway, railroad company. Uh, and I thought that was really, really interesting um, because it kind of obviously one of the things that was often discussed was this link to, um, you know, from Gunflint to Ely. And uh, in 1897, the Duluth and Iron Range had actually done a survey uh, and they basically done a cost analysis of building from Ely to Gunflint Lake. And um, I guess they weren't happy with the, what the cost came across. It came, it came out to be something like two and a half million dollars to build from Ely to Gunflint. Um, but I don't think they ever dropped the idea. And what was interesting is um, they're in the um, Library and Archives Canada, which is located in Ottawa, which is Canada's uh, national uh, archives. Um, there is a, a letter 
that was received by Canadian Northern Railway, who owned the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway at the time. Um, um, basically, this letter was addressed to them by the Duluth and Iron Range Railroad Company, and they were inquiring if they had a map of the uh, railway line in Minnesota. And, and there's nothing sort of beyond that. There's just a couple of letters, um, you know, uh, a collection, maybe it was five or six sheets of paper in this file. But I, I just find it, find it very, very intriguing that, you know, the Duluth and Iron Range actually owns some, some land, um, you know, just south of... Um, you know, section 26 here in that general area. And, uh, you know, at around that time, they're kind of making inquiries about, you know, where's the railway line in the area. So, um, like I said, kind of a, a, an interesting little sort of tidbit. Now, um, for the sake of brevity, we don't have time to sort of go through everything that kind of happened from that early 1900s event uh, up until the last sort of event in, in 1921. Um, you know, it, there's nothing really significant that's going on. Um, after I'll kind of point you to a source where you can you can read about some of the, um, you know, little things that were going on. There was, there, there were some explorations going on. There was an exchange of land. Um, those types of things are going on, but nothing super significant. The, the next really big thing that happens uh, happens in 1921 and it happens very very quickly and it's uh, kind of very very explosive and then it just kind of like everything else just very quickly just disappears all right so where does it all start well in november of 1920 uh, this is a uh, uh, article that appears in the uh, the cook county news herald and so basically it talks about this arthur mitchell uh, who at the time was well known in the Grand Marais area because he had actually tried to do some railway ventures and kind of had done some mining exploration in the area. Uh, basically, he was up here with a, a, it says, a party of explorers from Chicago. Uh, and um, he talks about one of them is the uh, editor of the largest Polish daily in the United States. And then there's another guy, uh, this Joseph Mirzinski. Uh, I do apologize. Some of these names are, are hard to pronounce, and I hope I'm doing it justice. Um, basically, is one of the members, and kind of remember that name because it's going to come up very, very shortly. So, um, okay, what's sort of going on? And then sort of the next little kind of thing that happens uh, in March of 1921, um, there's talk in the city of Port Arthur uh, about uh, an iron mine that is located to the west uh, of Thunder Bay uh, being sold. And one of the things that um, was in the city of Port Arthur was actually a blast furnace uh, that had been built uh, to refine iron that had basically been, um, you know, constructed to, uh, to accommodate, you know, um, sadly, all these failed iron ventures. Uh, and so it talks a little bit about that in there, right? So some, something's going on. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, about a month and a half later, in the uh, one of the Port Arthur newspapers, uh, we see this article here that talks a little bit about uh, there's plans to repair the old Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway, uh, and so it says that the uh, the general manager uh, of the uh, the company that owns the railway, which is now Canadian National uh, Railway, which CN, which still exists today, um, basically it arrived in Winnipeg and and they basically took a trip down the railway and um, it says that it is understood the officials are making a complete survey of the PD road in order to determine which portions may be repaired and which parts require rebuilding. In connection above is also said that there's a possibility of the Paulson mine reopening. Uh, but this has not been confirmed, right? So there's kind of rumors floating around there. And then uh, a couple days later, right, you know, these guys are back from their, for their trip. Uh, and so it says, regarding the rumored development of the PD uh, from North Lake, um, uh, this guy, you know, the, the, the people refuse to talk. We have nothing for publication, right? And, and so, you know, something's afoot, something's going on, but nobody knows specifically what's going on. Well, a, a month later, the cat comes out of the bag. And so this is an article and it, it talks a little bit about how the Chicago capital will extend the railway to the ore fields, bringing the product here. And um, I just wanna stop here for a second and I wanna talk a little bit about this. Um, this is one part of the, uh, the, 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 the history of the Paulson mine, which I knew about in the past and, and I did have some information about it, but this is sort of really kind of um, interest me interested me of, as of late, and, and I'll give you a little reason why. So back in February, um, I got a, an email from the uh, from from Carrie at the, the Cook County Historical Society, and she had received an email from from a lady that was you know had found in, in her 
uh, father's papers or somebody's papers that basically this stock certificate for this mining company and she wanted to kind of know about it and so of course Carrie emailed me and said you know can you you help out and I said sure I know a little little bit about this and so uh, I don't know why this kind of sort of triggered me a little bit and at the time I um, um, you know as I mentioned I am kind of working on a book that's kind of related to some of um, you know all of these things that I'm that I'm taking a look at, um, but I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of stalled a little bit with 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 the book right now because I I have some things that I need to uh, to get to which are now on hold because of the uh, the pandemic. Um, but basically, I said, uh, I'm kind of this is kind of intriguing a little bit. I want to kind of dig a little bit into this, and, and so I started doing some 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 research and I'll uh, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about this as I as I kind of go through this, uh, and so the article continues. Uh, and so it talks about that this gentleman who's representing a uh, company known as the Palatine Mining and Development Company of Chicago uh, and says they announced that they want to purchase the blast furnace, right? So that blast furnace that I talked about in the city of Port Arthur. He said he also outlined the proposed plans of the company with respect to the development of iron ore resources in Cook County, Minnesota, where the company controls upwards of 2,200 acres. Uh, it says, and it basically goes on the fact that uh, at the time, the railway terminated at North Lake and had basically not run to Gunflint in almost 20 years. And so it's talking about how they're gonna to have to rehabilitate uh, parts of the railway line and how all that work's gonna kind of play out. Here's a picture of the, uh, uh, from 1907 of the, um, the blast furnace in Port Arthur, um, you know, essentially their works. And uh, this was the, um, um, the building and the enterprise that was gonna be purchased by this Palatine company. And so then, you know, another article talks a little bit about what's going on. So it says, uh, by October 1st, the railway is going to reach the border. Uh, 50 men now engaged in ballasting, right? So again, this railway's, railway line has been neglected for 20 years. Um, there were actually forest fires that destroyed several bridges. Um, probably the biggest one was a 1,000-foot trestle on North Lake. So it goes on and talks about that... Um, um, uh, tenders for the construction of two bridges. So it says one is a thousand feet long, the other 500 feet. Uh, he wants the, this gentleman, Mr. Hogan, wants to get everything going as quickly as possible. Um, you know, he talks about that he is representative of the Palatine Mining and Development Company and, um, um, you know, all these great things that they're going to do. Uh, and then, you know, at the same time, we see this article coming out of Minneapolis and it's the title is Minnesota's Deserted Village May Attempt to Come Back. And it's talking basically about you know, Gunflint and, and the area around the Paulson mine. And this article goes into detail about kind of all the things that were happening. And, and what's interesting as well, too, is it talks a little bit about going back to the uh, the original days, back to the, the, the Paulson days, um, you know, how, you know, things were, uh, things were left behind. There were like axes that were embedded in trees that are still uh, sit, sitting there. Then it talks about things like uh, large equipment um, uh, hoists, um, you know, et cetera. All this stuff was just left there. Some of it's still in the crates, um, you know, still left in its spot, right? So, um, you know, people, again, this excitement is building for, uh, you know, a comeback of the, uh, of the Paulson mine. And so a couple days later, um, again, there's another train that's leaving that they're going to go for an inspection. And so the, again, this Mr. Hogan, uh, he's talking a little bit about, um, you know, that he's going to be on this train. And with him uh, is this, again, this Joseph Mirzinski. Remember the guy that was in, was in Grand Marais back in November of 1920? Well, he's back. He's the president uh, of this Palatine Mining and Development Company. And essentially, he's on this inspection run. Um, it talks about how they have signed a, an agreement with the railway. And uh, basically, they are going to lease the railway line from North Lake all the way to Gunflint. Uh, but they're not, there's no details they're going to talk about, right? Like it's all kind of hush hush, right? Um, and then a couple days later, they're talking about how, um, you know, drilling has started and, and all these things are kind of um, going on. And everybody's, again, everybody's getting excited. Everybody's building for all of these things that are happening. And, and you know, all the details got to kind of be worked out. Now, what I'd like to do is, is kind of pause for a second here and talk a little bit about um, this company um, that is trying to get everything going. And this is kind of the intriguing part of the story. Um, and again, this is this is all new kind of new information because I just started looking at this stuff in February. And unfortunately, it actually, uh, my research kind of got halted a little bit by the whole pandemic. 
And so uh, as I started researching this, this Palatine Mining and Development Company, um, I found that it was basically um, the people that, that operated the mining company were also operating this other company that had already been established at the time, this Palatine Commercial Corporation. And so this is uh, right from a, a website that has some, some a little bit of information about them, some photographs. And so it says the Palatine Commercial Corporation began in 1917 as a cooperative of stores catering to the Polish um, American community. The organization soon opened training schools in the Chicago metro area to provide business and management training for its members. By 1919, the education component of the company grew. Uh, the organization all pu published a, a company paper to share information, right? So this was a, a you know previously established company and it was actually a very uh, well-established company with with uh, with a, a bit of history uh, and a lot of assets and a lot of people working for it. And uh, what's kind of interesting as well is that th this company was actually um, uh, not started in um, Chicago. It was actually, or in Illinois, it was actually started in Arizona. And it was one of the things that I was actually probing at the time when the whole kind of um, pandemic thing broke um, because... Um, and I'll show you in a second here. I, I, I actually was able on the internet find a stock certificate. And so the Palatine Commercial Company was actually started in Arizona. And that's kind of the really confusing thing is I don't quite understand why it was started. And so I was actually making inquiries in Arizona trying to get their articles of incorporation. Uh, and I was kind of corresponding with, um, w with a woman at the... Uh, uh, Arizona Corporations Commission, and like I said, this whole pandemic thing kind of broke, and um, I guess when things settle down a little bit, I'm going to have to try to get back in touch with her, because they were having trouble trying to find the articles of incorporation. But anyway, uh, again, I was able to find some of this information uh, on the internet, and so this is the Palatine Commercial Corporation. This is their office uh, in Chicago, right? So again, not, you know, some sort of fly-by-night sort of corporation, not somebody that was looking to do shady things, um, you know, obviously by the judging by the size of their, uh, by their office is a well-established corporation. Uh, this was one of their stores um, in the, in the, the Chicago area. So again, you know, very well-established company. Here's that stock certificate that I was talking about. You can't kind of make it up, make it out on the top there. It's kind of very small, but um, basically the seal says incorporated under the laws of the state of Arizona. And again, I'm, you know, hoping to, uh, to sort of probe that a little bit more once things sort of settle down. And so, uh, again, the people that were behind that Palatine Commercial Corporation were the ones that, uh, uh, you know, incorporated this mining company. Why they kind of went into mining, why they got turned on to, you know, this iron deposit in Cook County, Minnesota. Uh, again, um, I mean, maybe something will turn up, maybe something won't, we, we don't know. Uh, anyway, I was able to get their, their, the articles of incorporation for the mining company um, from the state of Illinois. And so basically, um, you know, it talks about, um, you know, how it was, uh, was uh, incorporated, um, you know, in um, uh, 1920. Um, and, and so, uh, again, this is all kind of falling into place rather quickly. So right at the end of 1920, when this company was being established, the president uh, of this company, much like the, uh, the Palatine commercial, uh, we have a guy by the name of Joseph Mirzinski. And again, I do apologize if I'm butchering any of these names. Um, uh, both of my parents are Italian, uh, so, um, you know, uh, I'm probably not very good with the Polish name. So, Joseph Mirzinski is the president, a guy by the name of Frank Bydra is the secretary, and the treasurer is a guy by the name of Stanley Grabowski. Uh, and again, these guys are the ones who are very much associated with the uh, with the Palatine Commercial Corporation. So, a couple pictures for you that I was able to track down. Uh, so, uh, the president, Mirzinski, on the, on the left, and then uh, Bydra um, uh, on the right. And what was kind of interesting, uh, again, uh, this whole sort of delve into the Palatine Company started with that inquiry from the Cook County uh, Historical Society and that woman that had the stock certificate. And I, I don't know what sort of made me think of it. Uh, at one point I went, hey, hold on a second. I actually have a stock certificate uh, or a certificate from the Palatine Mining and Development Company. So I pulled mine out. And so uh, you can see the one that I, I think I purchased off um, eBay or something like that. Uh, and so this stock certificate, it says that it certifies that Stanislaw Kezior uh, has purchased from the Palatine Mining and Development Company 2,000 tons of iron um, to be mined from the Tucker Claim in the Paulson Mine located in the county of Cook, state of Minnesota. 
uh, and it's dated the 10th day of February 1921. And then you can see the signatures at the bottom. There's Frank Wydra's signature and Joseph Merzinski's um, signatures, right? So uh, my own little personal piece of uh, collection of the Palatine Company. Now, um, we see all these things that are happening in, you know, being reported in Cook and being reported in, in Thunder Bay, but what's going on in Chicago? And so um, I was able to track this down. And so this was an article that appeared in um, one of the Polish uh, daily newspapers in Chicago. Uh, you can see the date, the 8th of July, 1921. Again, I do apologize if I butcher this. Um, just doing my best here. So the, 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 the um, newspaper was the uh, Zenik uh, Chicagoski, um, which translates to the Chicago Journal. And uh, again, um, this is all Google Translate. So uh, again, I apologize to anybody if I butcher this. And so this is this is literally a full page ad in this Polish daily newspaper. And essentially what you can see in here uh, is essentially you can see, uh, obviously it's a map, there's Gunflint Lake, there is the railway line. And so you can see the original railway line coming down, making its big loop into the switchback, and then making another switchback to the pulse and mine. Now, what is interesting though, you do see another uh, railway line appearing here uh, that's going into a different spot, into a different section of the of the township, right? And so what you can see here on the map is you can basically, I'm, I'm guessing this cross-hatched area is the, the iron formation. And so it says that um, this chunk here, uh, I think it says 850 acres or 950 acres. It says the pulse in mine, Palatine controls on a 99 year lease. Uh, then this big chunk over here, 1400 acres, 1440 acres, Palatine mine uh, owned by the Palatine company. And then down here, uh, the Tucker mine, uh, it says Palatine controls on a 99 year lease. Now, what does it say in Polish? Uh, again, according to the good folks at Google, uh, the top line says 25 um, million tons uh, 250 million tons of iron uh, on 2,500 acres of mine land. Um, and then it says, obviously, Palatine, uh, which is the name of the country, uh, the company. And then at the bottom, um, it says, uh, these mines are located in Minnesota, which produces over um, 50 million tons of ore annually. Uh, and so essentially what we have is we have uh, these guys uh, trying to sell uh, this investment uh, to the Polish community in Chicago, right? And, and so they're trying to uh, trying to line up the investors to invest in this in this enterprise. So, um, like I said, kind of uh, kind of interesting. And I do have quite a number of uh, other articles and things like that from this uh, from this uh, Polish newspaper. Um, again, not easy to sort of translate everything. Um, not sure I'm quite understanding everything in there, but uh, sort of doing my best. So then, fat, you know. Into July, it's talking a little bit about you know how the uh, the drilling's going on. Everything's kind of falling falling into place. You know they're they're negotiating for the rebuilding of the railway line and, and works happening, and everybody's kind of getting excited. Um, and so uh, fast forward to the end of August, um, we basically have a very very important visit, and so it's essentially talking about. Uh, 47 directors of the Palatine Mining and Development Company with its headquarters at Port Arthur arrived this afternoon in autos from Duluth. Um, so basically these guys drove from Chicago to Duluth, then drove up the North Shore uh, to uh, Thunder Bay. And what they were going to do um, is basically visit um, this site, right? And so uh, essentially you have uh, the original members of the Palatine Company and they're essentially bringing up all these potential prospective investors and they're going to go check this out to I guess to show these guys um, you know this is what we're after and um, this is why we want your money uh, so it talks about how they're all Polish and are located in many cities in the United States they grouped in Chicago uh, it says they will leave by train special Canadian national train on Wednesday for Gunflint uh, and an inspection of the Paulson mine and property um, and, and you know again there's all this excitement however fast forward a little bit Right, that that is literally that visit happens, and then all of a sudden after that, nothing is heard from them, and so um, this is a, a report published in a Canadian um, publication. So this is the uh, the Canadian uh, government, the Department of Mines of Canada, uh, a report that was published uh, in late eight, uh, 1921. Uh, so it talks about says in early 1921, a company known as the Palatine Mining uh, Corporation. 
uh, said to be a subsidiary of a large Polish-American cooperative society having its headquarters in Chicago, secured an option on the Atacocan uh, Iron Company's blast furnace in, in Port Arthur with the declared intention of putting it, into, uh, putting it into blast on ore from the old Paulson mine. Um, they also secured from the city an option of 200 acres of land. Uh, a start was made on overhauling the blast furnace plant and a little work was done in extending the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway from North Lake to the Paulson mine. A change appears to have then been made in the original plans and the idea of using the Paulson mine or Paulson mine or abandoned. At the time of my visit in October, so obviously the person who wrote this report actually went to the Paulson mine site, work was practically at a standstill. And the company was said to be considering the acquisition of the Atacocan Magnetite Mine. Uh, and so there's um, iron deposits that are located west of Thunder Bay in a place called Atacocan, which eventually did become an iron mine during a uh, big iron mine in the 1940s. Uh, and the Loon Lake Hematite deposits, all of which in Ontario. Uh, and so all of a sudden there's this, there's this shift, there's this change. Uh, and then, um, you know, December of 1921, all of a sudden you see this in reports. Uh, and so this is out of Alabama. And it says the Palatine Mining and Development Company has filed trust deeds covering 6,000 acres of mineral lands in DeKalb County to secure a contemplated bond issue uh, using the development of coal and iron properties. Right. And so then it talks about, you know, the, uh, you know, the people involved with that. So all of a sudden they literally go from doing all of this work, all of this, you know, um, you, you know, hype about, you know, the pulse in mind and, and doing all these things, all of a sudden crickets. Right. And all of a sudden now we're doing things in in Alabama. And as far as I can determine, nothing ever happened in Alabama as well. And so the question sort of becomes is, you know, what kind of happened with all of this? Like. How did they go from, you know, this massive interest to all of a sudden they make this exploration and all of a sudden, poof, it, it disappears, right? And, and we don't, as of right now, we really don't have an answer. Obviously, something turned them off of this. And what's interesting um, is I'm actually going to read you a little excerpt from uh, this book. Um, and if you don't have a copy of this, um, you can pick this, this up. This is uh, a book uh, called Pioneers in the Wilderness. You can see it's written by um, Dr. Willis Raff and is basically the history of uh, Cook County, Minnesota. And you can get a copy from the, uh, the Cook County Historical Society. We'll plug for them there. Um, and so in there, he actually talks about this. Now, um, Dr. Raff didn't have access to some of the same information that I presented to you. Uh, and, and so he was kind of, you know, working with very limited kind of resources. Um, but um, it's kind of interesting at, at the end of the section where he's talking about this, um, he actually kind of sort of postulates, right, how this kind of played out, right? Uh, and he talks about this, this visit uh, that was made. And so um, he says, um, imagine more than 50 men from big cities in more than 20 canoes, right? Because there's no, there's no way to get from the end of the railway at North Lake to, 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 to Gunflint. Right, the, the the there's the big trestle on, on North Lake is out. There's no way to get there. The line's basically been abandoned for 20 years. Uh, some of the steel's been ripped up. Right, so they're going to have to basically travel over water. So imagine more than 50 men from big cities in more than 20 canoes. The winds of North Lake, the confusion of the short port uh, railway portage into Little Gunflint. Uh, which again, if you watch some of my other presentations, you'll know what I'm talking about here. The headwinds on Gunflint Lake. Or was it perhaps one of those rare uh, days of calm water? Uh, Gunflint Lake is very notorious for being rather rough. Uh, the overnight camp at the Narrows. Imagine also the confusion of breaking camp at sunrise. The long trek to the west along grown over and eroded trails and wagon roads. Their views of fire-destroyed trestles, their soaking wet boots, the mosquitoes, the bushwhacking necessary to arrive at the widespread diggings, the sprained ankles and sore muscles, their clothes wet from perspiration or rain, the short tempers. For all of those, uh, for all along their uh, backwoods odyssey, those pilgrims of mining investments uh, must have become more and more keenly aware of the difficulties they faced. The impossibilities of convenient travel to Grand Marais over the wagon road were obvious. From their own recent experience, they could suspect that it would cost um, what it would cost to reconstruct the PD from North Lake Station to the mine site. Uh, for they had actually seen, had inspected the road the roadbed along several stretches north of Gunfoot Lake. Um, and then it goes on to say, whatever their reactions to the experiences, whether of dismay or continued optimism in the face of serious obstacles, the Polish delegation disappeared from the face of the earth, so far as newspaper readers in Cook County were aware. Not one more word about the men or their planned enterprise was uh, ever again appeared in a local paper. Um, 
and, and so I, I think um, Raf sums it up well. Uh, I think you know these these guys uh, that started the Palatine company had some great ideas. They brought these individuals to take a look at this, and these investors took one look at this and went, "Nope, we're out." We're out, right? Like this is this is ridiculous. Like, I mean, the amount of money it's going to cost to rebuild the railway to open this all up, this is not worth our investment. We're just going to end up losing our shirt. Um, and, and you know, when it comes to the Paulson Mine and it comes to the Gunflint Iron Range, uh, this was really the last uh, sort of serious attempt to to exploit uh, the iron that was there. Um, obviously, the um, uh, you know the, the properties changed hands back and forth several times there was some you know some explorations and things that were done in the years afterwards uh almost right up until the time that um you know the uh the boundary waters canoe area was was um you know developed um you know the the idea was sort of still sort of kicking around now that iron range does continue north of the border and uh again there's been some uh ideas kicked around about kind of opening up the uh the range again um, there were some, even probably about five or six years ago, I had read some things about some explorations being done uh, in the Whiteflesh Lake area. Uh, again, I'm not sure how that would all kind of play out. The uh, The railway line is long gone, and um, since the late 80s, CN has basically sold off the right of way. Uh, so that is no longer an option. So uh, again, that kind of brought to an end this whole sort of uh, sordid experience. And, um, you know, I mean, hopefully you've kind of uh, enjoyed all of this and, and, and seen, um, you know, how this all kind of played out over many, many years. There's still tons and tons of stuff that, that we're still learning. Like I said, just as of two weeks ago, I, I, I was able to get my hands on, on those materials from, from U.S. Grant. And um, all of this stuff with the Palatine Company is, is all, uh, some of it is relatively brand new. And again, I'm still sort of in the process of digging into it. My plan is once I finish my book on this other topic that I'm working on, uh, which is the subject of one of my other presentations that you can take a look at, the Gunflint and Lake Superior Railroad, um, uh, I plan to actually, I want to write an article, uh, an essay uh, about the uh, the Palatine Company. And uh, again, because it spans both sides, right? This company, uh, you know, was planning on um, rebuilding the railway, of shipping the ore to, uh, to Thunder Bay. Uh, so it involves, um, you know, people and, and things on both sides of the border. So as I wrap up tonight's presentation, I uh, just want to leave you with, uh, with a few last little things here. First of all, uh, I've shown you some photographs, I've shown you some places. Uh, again, some of these places are accessible. If, um, you know, uh, if you live in the area, you're very familiar probably with the, uh, with the Centennial Trail. Uh, if you're not, you can travel up the Gunflint Trail uh, and you can visit some of these places uh, using the Centennial Trail. It's about a three mile loop. Uh, trail that will cover parts of the railway line and you will see some of the uh, the, the, the workings that were done um, again um, and, and this is sort of a nod to the, um, uh, the folks at the US Forest Service um, you know please remember that um, you know these uh, these are federal lands and they're protected by law um, please refrain from sort of picking up anything or removing anything uh, I know from my own personal history um, I've seen a lot of things disappear at some of these sites uh, like for example I know at one of the the shaft sites there was a gigantic iron bucket um, you know the thing must have been um, you know maybe about three feet tall by three feet wide it was this huge metal bucket uh, and uh, somebody took it somebody removed it um, you know and, and so you know try to leave these you know leave these artifacts where they are um, you know they have a huge archaeological uh, value um, so again, um, you know, um, do the uh, do the Forest Service guys a favor and, and just uh, just take photographs, right? And and, uh, and and save the history exploring for for some other people. All right, so uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, before I wrap things up uh, with the last slide here, I do want to bring this to your attention. Um, I do want to um, mention uh, that. Um, the slide that you see on the screen here talks about my next presentation, which is supposed to uh, happen um, at the Chickwalk Museum, which is at the end of the Gunflint Trail, uh, on Sunday, July the 26th at, at uh, 2 o'clock uh, Central Time. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, on a topic called The Country Beyond, which is basically talking a little bit about life uh, north and Gunflint Lakes. 
um, during the period that essentially the railway was um, in operation there. So it's essentially an, uh, an amalgamation of some of the things that I've talked about here, talked about in some of the previous presentation. There's going to be a lot of new material that I'm going to be built, uh, bringing in. So, um, you know, some, some new angles, talking a little bit more about people and talking a little bit about what these, these individuals were doing kind of, uh, kind of at the time. Uh, so that is planned to go Sunday, July the 26th. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of hesitating a little bit is because um, that may or may not happen. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news, the um, both governments, so the American and the Canadian government, have agreed to keep the border closed uh, for at least another month. And so it is now closed almost to the end of June, and we don't know what's going to happen beyond that. And so... Um, if that is extended, I might not actually be able to get to the Chickwalk Museum for the presentation. And so I might up end up having to do some sort of um, virtual presentation for the people in attendance. We'll have to, uh, I'll have to talk to Bonnie at the, uh, at the museum and, um, you know, talk a little bit about what our, what our options are uh, once, uh, once we get a little bit closer to that time. But just so you're aware of that um, and uh, you know that that is coming up. So uh, last slide here. And again, if you've seen the presentation before, you are familiar with this. And so this is just a recapitulation of some of the things that you saw at the beginning of the presentation. So again, ladies and gentlemen, um, there is a lot of information that is out there uh, on some of these topics. Um, I do have a website that you can take a look at and I do have a, a whole section on uh, the pulse in mine and it does have some of the historical things that we've talked about it does have some pictures some of the maps I showed you also has a uh, link to some YouTube videos um, that I've shot over the years um, do have uh, social media presence so I am on Facebook uh, Twitter uh, Instagram again if you have any questions or anything that you would like to ask uh, please do not hesitate to contact me at the uh, email address that you see up there on the screen. And um, again, uh, check out some of the social media pages. I'm always uh, out and uh, doing things. Uh, for example, um, not this past weekend, the weekend before, I was out at North Lake, uh, on the Canadian side of North Lake, obviously. And so taking a look at some things down there. And hopefully, uh, once the, uh, the border opens back up, uh, I do have some field work that I'm planning to do in Minnesota, and so hopefully I can get down there once again, and um, there's a few people I'd like to see and to visit and chat with. I um, haven't seen them in a while, and obviously there's some uh, some work that I would like to do as well. So again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, it's been a pleasure to um, do these presentations over the last couple of months. Um, again, this presentation will be uh, saved and so you can re-access this presentation again and watch it back or share the link with anybody who might be interested. Um, uh, this presentation, all the other ones are available on my YouTube channel which you can see the link that is there. Again, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. And so um, I want to wish everybody a good evening and again, um, maybe I'll hear from some of you soon and I want to um, encourage people, if you can, to come and uh, to the presentation at the Chick Walk uh, in July, if you can make it, if I can make it. Uh, and again, I just want everybody to stay safe. And um, thank you again for tuning in. Have a good evening.